Good afternoon, everyone, and it's great to be with here, you here today. Um, my name is Loretta brancasio Terrace, and I'm the Director of eLearning at Kingsborough Community College. So for the past 10 years, I have taught uh, online, and you can see the picture of my college where on the Atlantic in New York, and um, it's a beautiful campus on the Atlantic Ocean, but not easy for our students to get to. So we've really made a push for online um, classes and online programs. So after teaching for about 10 years, and here I thought I was swimmingly well, at the end of the semester, I gave uh, my students an assignment and they had to send me images and a brief description to answer the following questions. Um, what did you feel like the first day you logged into our course? What did you think of the course organization and navigation? And what did you think about the technologies we'd used in the course? So for that first question about um, the course navigation, they said they felt overwhelmed. Well, they thought it was gonna be a nightmare. Next, uh, for what do they think about the course organization and navigation? They told me it looked like my messy closet or Another student said it was like trying to hit a target blindfolded. Last question about the technologies that we use. One student told me it was making his head spin. And another student told me it was like being in a pocket of a plane and they were expected to fly it. So I decided I should look at some of the research on online learning. And here are just a few of those highlights. So students who don't log in within the first days are unlikely to be successful. Between 10 to 20% of students who begin to disengage in about week three or four. 12% of students who did withdraw based on their decision, um, is, it's about their experience with the online instructor and they cited poor communication. And what they know about instructors based on the research is Instructor presence in an online course is one of the factors known to have a direct impact on student success and also encouraging communication and feedback builds community in your online course. So I've told you a little bit about some of the student voices and the research findings. And so what of all of this is all course design choices you may make impact students engaging with you. So with that, let's talk about some of the best practices in online course design. And I've selected five that I think will be the most helpful to you, um, depending on whatever happens uh, for the fall. So here are the five we'll talk about. A clear communication plan, a routine for your course activities, be strategic, timely, and positive with feedback. View your course through the eyes of your learners and build community to encourage success. All right, so we'll go through each of these. So for a communication plan, the purpose of a communication plan is to define for you and your students what, when, and how information will be shared. If you make a communication plan, which you should, make sure you share it with students. And examples of some things that you should include in your communication plan, that you'll respond to questions within 48 hours on weekdays. So I got a lot of phone calls, so that's why I had that item there. Um, that I respond to emails Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. And that I'm available to answer emails about assignments on the day they're due from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. For general questions, um, I create a shared space in our learning management system that I call a cyber cafe. It's a discussion forum where people can share ideas, ask questions, answer questions, um, and be part of a, a community. Another way of doing that is for a shared doc. So those are just some things you could include in your communication plan. Next best practice is to develop a routine for your course. 
Routines are great because they create a predictable pattern for you and your students. So both you and your students don't feel like, I need to be in this course 24 seven. So here's an example of a, a pattern and a routine that I use in my course. So on Mondays, I always post a what's happening this week announcement and it's also emailed to my students. And in that, there are the learning outcomes for the week, there are the activities that they'll do. It's usually some combination of readings and videos and always a discussion. Also, I'll tell them about the assessments that they'll need to do and their due dates and how long it'll take students to complete the activities and assessments and that's helpful to them so they can budget their time properly. Wednesdays, always their initial discussion post is due. Fridays, that's the day our test or assignment is due. And then I spend the weekend sort of grading that. And then Sunday, I send a weekly wrap up about common themes, things that seem to be misconceptions, things that went well, uh, things to look out as we move through the future of the course. For best practice three, be strategic, be timely, and be positive about feedback. So for any of you that have created tests in your learning management system and haven't used a pool of questions and you've gone through that process of typing in every question, it is truly laborious. So if you create a map that aligns your questions with your learning outcomes, this is a way of examining your questions and first of all, it's possible to reduce the number of questions that way. If you have five outcomes and you see you have five questions, that might be sufficient for you to determine if the student has met that outcome. And it's also helping you to make sure every question you're answering, asking students to respond to addresses a learning outcome. If it doesn't, you need to think about, well, then why am I asking that question? Use alternative assessments with less text. So I gave an example of one earlier about the image gallery that students created for me and they're highly enlightening. It gives students a little chance to be creative. And another way is through videos, having students create videos. Yesterday, Jen Herzog um, showed us some beautiful videos um, that her students created uh, and showed us a way to use videos to show students doing some lab work at home. Another way to sort of be strategic about grading is using rubrics. Um, it's great to integrate those rubrics into your learning management system. And also make sure you share that rubric with your students. And the benefits of using rubrics is um, it makes grading efficient. If it's in your learning management uh, system, you click a bunch of radio buttons and you are done grading. It also makes your grading consistent. As you're grading a lot of papers, it gets hard to remember. Did I give this kind of answer three points or five points or no points? So it's helpful in that respect. And also, since you're sharing the rubric with your students, it sets the expectations for what a quality assignment will look like. As you can imagine, and I'm sure you've had this experience, you've submitted papers for review and you never hear from the journal. Um, schedule assessments and make sure that you can grade them in a timely manner. Um, usually within 48 hours is probably uh, a reasonable time. And if you can't, just make sure your students know it's gonna be 72 or 96 hours. Also to help um, with some of the feedback that you give students. If you see a common issue, send an announcement or an email. That's what I use my wrap up email on my Sundays for. So students have an idea of things that they, many of them had a misconception about. If you feel you need to comment on every assignment and everything they're doing, create a Word document of responses. Um, that you can you use and then you just simply cut and paste and that's really helpful to speed up the grading process, uh, process. Also be positive. It's hard to be positive when you have a lot of papers to grade and it's moving into your weekend activity. So you might want to consider creating audio feedback. Professors are great at talking so it might be a way for you to also give students feedback in another format or other than written text. Also, try to convey some emotion. 
Uh, usually, uh, professors write in this very formal, traditional voice, and students interpret that as anger. So use a little smiley face or a thumbs up, or when you have things that are really questionable in a student's work, maybe a kind of thoughtful uh, face rather than that big red X that's so easy to include when you have a lot of papers to grade. Okay, our fourth best practice. Um, see your course through the eyes of your learners. This is a really important one. And probably the best way to do this, take an online course and get that experience and you'll see what, it, what it's like. So some of the things in this practice four that we're gonna talk about. Simplify your course navigation. Be realistic about the student workload and let students know how long it will take them to do the work. Vary your activities to reflect different learner abilities. Make materials accessible and think about student availability to course content with regard to the devices they use and their connection. All right, so for navigation, when you log into your learning management system, there is a whole host of menu items on the side. And this is one of the things that's overwhelming to students. So I've changed my course menu, and it's really simple now. It has four items, a start here, and the start here, I tell students at the beginning of the semester, start here, go look at that stuff. And when they click on that um, tab, they see sort of an introduction to the course, how the course is going to proceed, and it explains the navigation. It explains that there's going to be 12 folders, um, for one for each week of the semester. And they can find those 12 folders in the tab labeled course content by week. When they go to a course content by week folder, in that folder is the learning outcomes for the week, any, um, activities they need to do, readings, videos, um, the assessments, so their exams, their tests, their discussion posts, their assignment, um, all in one spot. I just found students found that easier to navigate than when I had a separate tab for test, a separate tab for assignment, a separate tab for readings. Um, announcements, so I left that um, on my initial home screen because um, it's just an easy way that a student emails me and says, I don't know what we're doing this week. Like, why don't you go and look at the announcement um, dated July 8th. And for the home page, uh, left that there also sort of gives them a start, a place to get organized and get their thinking into biology. And I try to make it as attractive as I can in Blackboard, not that many ways. So I include images and also um, a welcoming statement that's welcome to Bio 100. All right, for next for workload, time, and varying activities. So we're gonna take this in two ways. First from the instructor viewpoint, and then from the student viewpoint. So for the instructors, we've talked about this already, but it's worth mentioning again. Follow the principles of good course design. This semester for the faculty I worked with, they did not follow the principles of good course design and not for any fault of their own. It was the immediacy of needing to go online. And yesterday, Mary Mon mentioned backward design and it was great to see so many people knew what backward design was. So by backward design, clearly stating your learning outcomes, starting at the end, align your outcomes with your activities and assessments, and also vary your assessments to simplify grading. So including something other than writing papers and texts. One thing to also consider, this will also help reduce some of your workload and time. When you write directions, anticipate the questions students are going to ask. Um, think of yourself in a room by yourself. You have one set of directions and that's it. And when you can't get from the directions what you're supposed to do, you have to email somebody and they're gonna email you. 
a lot of them are going to email you. So it will decrease the flow of email that you have if you write clearly stated directions. And even if you told them three weeks in a row how to post an announcement, do it again. It just makes them feel more secure and um, not have to go fishing all over the place. So here's an example um, of what some of my students see when they go into um, one of their weekly folders. So this week of the course was entitled Water, and this was about the Flint, Michigan water crisis. So if you notice, the first thing they see is the learning outcomes for the course. Next, what the activities are that they're going to do. Uh, so there were five activities for this week. I have them reading and I also have them watching videos. And I always tell them about how long it's gonna take them to do the reading. So estimate it. Um, one way to do that is you read it, time yourself, double it for the number of students, for the student number. Uh, then for the assessments, they're taking a quiz and I tell them about when the quiz opens, what the questions are, how many, how much time. And then also that they're going to post in a discussion forum and they're going to respond. Um, with the discussion forum, I mentioned the rubric that I'm going to use to grade their discussion post. So that's all in one space. And that's the first thing that students will see when they go to that folder. Again, so this helps students uh, manage their time um, and hopefully be able to complete the materials. A big issue with online class is accessibility and following the principles of universal design for learning. So some of the things you really need to think about are videos with captions. So plenty of people this semester were creating their own videos. If they don't have captions on, with, on them, think about it, okay? It's really hard. If students need captioning and you don't have captioning, you're not in compliance with ADA. So it might be worth it to hunt through all of the great resources that are already out there and use those that have been professionally produced rather than your kind of homemade office videos. Use alt text for images so it gives an explanation of what the image is for students that use a screen reader. When you select the font, it should be a sans serif font. So examples are Arial, Habitica, Avant Garde, Century Gothic. Geneva, and not those that have those little tick marks on them, like Times New Roman, American Typewriters, Bakersfield, or fancy ones like Apple Chancery. I know they look appealing, um, but from an, an ADA standpoint, students can't always see them. Color is another issue. Try to select color that has the greatest contrast. Black and white is great, blue and yellow, but not some of these unique flashy colors like teal and green or pink and blue. So if you'd like to use some type of color for emphasis, use highlight because highlight will be seen by students uh, as great scale if they don't see color. So they still get the idea of your emphasis. And finally, uh, use the headings feature in Word. So uh, in your uh, Word a ribbon towards the right-hand side, you have the heading options. The reason this is important is for students that use a screen reader, when you include those headings, the screen reader can jump from one heading to the next to the next. So if a student stops and decides, oh, I already looked at units one and two, I'm gonna go to unit three. They can do that immediately. If you don't use headings, they have to scroll through and listen to the entire transcript again. Another issue is, again, what students have um, accessible to them with regards to um, software. So many of my students tell me, I don't have PowerPoint. Um, and they also want to use devices like their phone where they might not have PowerPoint on it. So I always include um, materials in multiple uh, formats. So if I have a PowerPoint, I might also include it as a PDF so students can read that um, on their phone, on their tablet, and uh, while they're on the subway. And... Okay, so now for the devices and connection. And this is a really important thing to think about. First, 
are your students using a desktop, a laptop, a tablet, or their phone? And the other thing is, what kind of high-speed internet connection do they have? So for a lot of my students, they don't have a good internet connection. So what I'd like you to think about is this really cool diagram, and they call it a bandwidth immediacy matrix. All right, so bandwidth, the, the, that has to do with that high-speed internet connection that they're gonna have to have to view your materials. And then um, immediacy, meaning how fast are they gonna get a response? So the recommended tools are those in that green zone. So readings with text and images, discussion board where you can include text and images, and email. So those are tools students are gonna have, even with low bandwidth, they can access. And the immediacy is low, but that's not always a bad thing. Um, for some students, especially ones that aren't native speakers, if you're asking them to post in a discussion board, sometimes they want time to formulate a really rich answer, and that gives them time. Another group that think about using, low bandwidth and high immediacy. So those are collaborative documents, like a Google Doc, where everybody's in it, adding, subtracting, and participating in the course. A uh, group chat and messaging, if your LMS has it, that's another good tool. All right, so next, the high bandwidth ones, those that are in the yellow zone. These are pre-recorded videos and also asynchronous videos that you might have from, you recorded a Zoom session you had with, st with students and whether it just be the whole video file or just the audios. Becoming more difficult for students to access. And the last one, synchronous video section, sessions and audio conference. Really think about this. It puts some students at a disadvantage because they don't have high speed internet connection. Um, and it, this is becoming a huge access and equity issue in online learning. So I would ask you to really think about why do you want to do those synchronous sessions? Is it for you, because that's what you're comfortable doing, or is it for your students? Okay, next, our last best practice. Um, build community to encourage success. So one way to do that is through discussion boards uh, and have each student introduce themselves in a discussion board. Uh, have a place in your course site where students can help one another. A wiki is a great way to do that. Have an FAQ section, uh, section where students can ask questions about content with one another. You can participate in that, you might not want to, um, but just a place where questions can be answered rather than always having to email the instructor. Um, but also think about if you develop these things, you are the best model for your students of what an online student should be. So you need to participate in the discussion, not just answering, but also letting students know that it's, it was read. They could see that you checked and read it. Uh, sending emails that are timely and providing encouraging feedback. If you notice, we're saying a lot of these things over and over and over because they're really important. Okay, so let's talk a little about creating online dialogue. An introduction, discussion board's a great way to do this. Um, I do this with my students the first week, ask them to share something about themselves, why they took the course, um, ask them if they want post an image of themselves or an avatar representing them, and that's always interesting to see what they post, um, and also to respond to another student. Uh, so this is a way that students get used to the course. It's an easy way, a low stakes way for them to learn about how to do a discussion and to start a thread, and they like doing it. It makes them feel important and connected. Also, uh, when you decide you want to develop online dialogue with your class, the success of it depends on the design of the prompts that you give. So stay away from a discussion where you're asking students to explain something that there's only one correct answer. So for example, if you ask students to explain germ theory, there's only one 
correct answer to that. They might say it in different word, ways, but there's only one correct answer. Um, and also, if you design a discussion forum where students get to answer yes or no, because you didn't say that the discussion, your post needs to be five sentences and need to include the following elements, uh, doesn't lead to great discussion. So those are kind of discussion uh, killers. So if you want facts in a discussion, an example would be, ask students to list three reasons for climate change and no duplicates. So what this does is it prompts students to go in and start posting early and often because as it gets later, it gets harder to do this assignment. Um, another thing to do, ask students to respectfully disagree with one another. Um, and disagreeing is harder for students to do than to agree with one another, so they're usually more thoughtful in their response. And then from there, what you can do is take those responses and form groups and have students work on a particular aspect of the course together. Again, another way to build community. So if that's all too much work for you, some quick ways to give feedback. Um, when you set up a test, there are two boxes, correct response feedback, incorrect response feedback. Type something in that every student will see whether they get a correct response or an incorrect response. Feel like investing a little more time when you give an assignment, there's a feedback for the learner box. Um, type something in, or one technique that I like to do is I tell students, um, look at the stuff I underlined in your assignments, and those are points that are really significant. Um, and again, it just builds some nice back and forth and it makes them feel good. So we're coming to the end of our uh, presentation. So I'd like to just have us think more generally about online learning and why we need online learning. So here goes. Over the last 20 years, more than 34 million students in the United States have enrolled in college but left without a degree or a certificate. And most of those students are women that are single mothers um, and African Americans. Um, individuals that are born, born into families at the bottom of the income distribution who get a college degree have more upward mobility than those who do not. Okay, we all wanna be better than our parents, so that's a good one. Um, online has promoted greater access for students and allows them to use their own schedule to fit in their course content. And online learning has the potential to cause face-to-face -face instruction to improve because um, the design is more student-centered. So just good teaching doesn't stem naturally from a modality. Um, a good course on campus is not good because of the brick and mortar ambience. Likewise, a weak online course is not weak because it's delivered via the internet. Good teaching in any learning environment it requires attention to design and facilitation. And here are some just general resources, quality managers rubric, Chloe, online learning consortium, and EDUCAUSE. I thank you and I hope we have some time for some questions. We do have some time for some questions. I speeded it up there to get some <laughs> questions in. So um, the first is actually, it's not a question, but it was the must, most upvoted um, thing in the Q&A. And so I feel I must mention it, which is that um, people have said this has been the most helpful talk so far. And thank you for the concrete, specific information. So, oh, great, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. Mm -hmm. um, the next biggest question, and there are a lot of people who want to hear about this. You talked about it a little bit for reading, but how do you really get a good estimate of the time for student work? Um, so I gave you the one technique to estimate, you read it in double. The other thing that I've done is I've asked students. Um, I'll tell them, I'll, I'll email a few students, like, do me a favor. Could you time how long it takes you to read? And I try to pick students that I've seen their work. So I kind of have a sense of who is more together than others. And they'll give you a time and you can sort of take that gambit of time and average it. So that's another technique you could use. Um, someone also just asked actually in the chat, if you could go back to your last, sl last slide, I think with the quote. I'll give it a shot. There we go. I think. Um, okay, and then another, question that has been popular is um, 
wanting to know if you could talk a little bit about how you manage to do um, all of the work involved in preparing and um, facilitating an online course if you're um, doing this for multiple classes, right? A lot of us are teaching, you know, three classes at once. So can you maybe give us some of your yeah. insights from your many years of experience? Okay, start early and often. Start early is one. Um, the other, look, there is so many great resources out there. Don't think you need to create. I would think that's probably the biggest mistake. Borrow from people, see what other courses are out there and use materials already created. Look at the, you know, the open educational resources and start from there. And share with your colleagues in your department and create a shared you know, document of materials that you use. Yes, yes. I think, okay, sorry, I'm scanning through our questions here. Um, can you go more into the push-pull about synchronous and asynchronous sessions? Is there something to be said about students connecting to each other during a semester or connecting with an actual person who can respond to their needs in real time? Yeah, I was waiting for that, Amy. <laughs> so my classes are fully online. Um, and my students really have trouble with the setting of the time. So I asked my students, so it's a little different from what we did this semester. Do you wanna meet? Do you, do you wanna have a second? And they're like, oh no, I don't wanna meet with you. Why would I wanna meet with you? That's why I signed up for an online class. However, there is value to having synchronous sessions that are designed well. And designed well is not, I'm going to present content. Designed well is, giving a student assignment before, and then bringing to their attention things that they have misconception about and having more of Q&A rather than presentation of content. There's a wealth of content out there. Students don't need to hear you speak about it. But they do wanna hear about, how can you help me, professor, be a better biology student? And what are the things I need to do in this class? Do I need to write better posts? Do I need to go back and look at materials in a different way? I'm not a fan of, as of synchronous, I hate to tell you, as you probably guessed. <laughs> Could you, now we've had a request, can you go one slide forward to the resources Abs slide? Uh, oh, um, I think it was this one. Yes. And then okay. I think this might be our last question, but we'll see. Um, what is your opinion on letting students work ahead um, in the material, particularly in all asynchronous format or um, versus keeping them on a set schedule? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, I think it depends on the students and, and you know, who they are. I set up my, my whole course and it's available to them. Um, the only thing that I don't release ahead of time are the tests, but the assignments are ready. Um, I've only had, in all of the years of doing it, I've only had a few that like go ahead. Um, what I think the reverse is what's true for most of my students, they can't keep up. And I want them to do well. And being online is difficult. So although we have deadlines, I negotiate. Okay, I don't give away the store, but I negotiate because sometimes students are online for a reason and some, one reason is they're really shy and they work and they have family commitments. So they're never going to say, I didn't submit my work because my three children were really sick. Mm -hmm. So if you reach out to them and say, hey, I see you didn't hand in the last three assignments, you know, is there something going on? Um, they might reach out to you or can we do something? Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. So I release everything and, you know, for, just keep in, let your students know this isn't a correspondence course where you can do everything the first week or you could do everything the last week. Thank you once again. And you'd hear robust clapping if we were a person, <laughs> but you'll just get my clapping. Now. All right. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Thanks, Thank everybody. You,